And then God said, let there be light, which is the topic for this tutorial. Now we want to create the look of a, like a morning kitchen countertop. Like you just woke up in the morning, the sunlight's coming in and it's warm and it's inviting. So we're going to want to have some sunlight coming in uh, from the left. Now we could take our default lamp here and turn it into a sun lamp and then try to angle it like that. But the reason that this looks so terrible is that one of the key components of natural light is not just the sunlight, but the skylight around it. Getting that uh, the right shades of blue and white and the gradient as it goes towards the horizon. And that's actually quite difficult uh, to do. But thankfully, there's a relatively newish feature in Blender which we can use. So rather than uh, using any lamp at all, I'm gonna delete the lamps so there is no light in my scene whatsoever. And instead, go to my world uh, tab here. And then where we've got color, I'm gonna click the little yellow dot and then select sky texture. And what this has added is uh, besides just the sky texture, it's also added in a sun lamp. So if I rotate around, we should see, look at that, real sunlight coming across it. Now it is very hot by default. So if you go to your render settings, underneath color management at the very bottom here, you've got an exposure slider, which you use actually quite a lot. Um, you can see the lighting has stayed the same um, and it doesn't have to re-render anything. This is purely just adjusting, yeah, the, the sensor essentially on your camera. And if you hold down control, uh, I usually just snap it to a minus two. Now back to the sky settings. So what this is, uh, yeah, essentially it's created the exact look of the sky, a real sun lamp, that little sun disc over there, and everything will change depending on what you set, like the elevation, right? If you set it to be like uh, really low in the sky, well, that's like morning light. And you can see it's, it's uh, changed everything to be like a warm look, right? So we've got like really warm light over everything. And if you change it to be like noon, like the sunlight is coming directly above it, you can see it's a lot colder. And that's because uh, as the sunlight goes lower in the sky, it's now passing through more of the atmosphere. So it's like decaying the light and you get, um, yeah, you get like an orangey look, but as it goes more vertical, then it's a lot more clearer and cleaner. Anyway, it's a very cool setting that is uh, relatively, relatively new in Blender. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna actually gonna leave it at the default at around 15 degrees. Um, the one thing I will change though is the sun size. So you get like really, um, yeah, like clean, hard shadows from the sun. And this sun size here, the reason for this very weird measurement, 0.545 degrees, is because it's actually the real sun size in relation to the earth. But there are reasons for changing that because if the sun goes through a cloud, then obviously the cloud is now lighting up and it's creating more of a dispersed look. So from the look of the camera, I usually just adjust this to be like a two or a three and it just makes the sun a little bit softer around the edges um, and a little nicer, at least according to me. Awesome, so looks better, but now we have uh, another problem, which is that the skylight is just bleeding in um, from, from all directions, right? Because obviously it would. So we need to create uh, an enclosure around it to obviously act as an indoor space. And just before we do that though, whilst I was preparing for this tutorial, I noticed that the donuts are a little close to my backsplash here. And that matters because uh, we're gonna use depth of field later to make things that are behind it are like out of focus, but we can't really do that if it's too close to the backsplash. So I'm just gonna increase the distance there and also just scale it up a little bit because um, now that it's in the background, um, yeah, otherwise you'll see like the corners actually appear in the render, which we, which we don't want. So just make that a little bit bigger, move it up. Okay, that's pretty good. So essentially, yeah, you just wanna have like one, two, three-ish plate widths, I think will do it. Uh, but yeah, something like that. And I also now just wanna make sure, ah, just fiddling around with this now, but yeah, this has gotta be positioned exactly on the plate as well. Awesome, okay, so that enclosure. Obviously to create that enclosure, we are going to be adding in a cube. So shift A, mesh, cube and I want to scale this down because although it is like a kitchen right nothing outside of the frame is going to be in the shot 
So making it bigger than it needs to be is just gonna add to the render times because then light has to bounce around those things and yeah, not good. So um, yeah, something scaled about that. I don't know, something like that. Now, uh, really what I want it to do is just like that corner here, I want it to be locked to this point. Like I want to move it to that point. And previously in Blender, this was a really fiddly process. I would have to tap G and then Z, move along that, and then try and time it here and then hit tap G and then Y and move it. And it would never be exactly correct. It would always just be slightly off. Well, now there is a new feature in Blender, literally that came in this release 4.0 that has changed the game. So there was a bunch of uh, snapping improvements. So I will show you them now. So it's actually easy to understand if you just go into wireframe mode. So if I tap G, so I'm moving my cube. Uh, if you hit B, it now enters you into a new state called snapping mode. So the first thing it's asking you is uh, what is the origin of the, the object that you're moving that you want to be the snapping point. So essentially, as I mouse over this, you can see the cursor is changing. When it's a circle, that means it's it's uh, gonna snap to that face. If it is a crosshair, that's that edge. If it's a triangle, that's the middle point of the edge, which is sometimes useful. And if it's a square, then that's a vertice. So this is on the object that is selected right now, okay? So I obviously want that corner vertice. So I'm just gonna do a single click there. Now, after I've clicked, you can see I'm able to select whichever point in the rest of the scene I wanna snap it to. So just like, again, it's a square when it's a vertice. So when I'm on these faces here, uh, right there, I'll do a single click. And there we go. So you can see it's perfectly aligned it uh, with the bottom of that uh, that backsplash there. Now it is, it is a little weird, I'll, I'll be honest, like, Maybe it's more weird because I've been using Blender for so long. Maybe beginners find it a little bit easier. But yeah, like the fact that you're in a move state, then you're hitting B and you're, you you will be moving it, but it's in a snapping mode rather than a, a placement mode. It is a little weird. And also just to make it even more complicated, you can hold down Alt at any point and then middle mouse to can, uh, drag around. Because sometimes you want to snap like that point uh, but then you need to select a point underneath an object. So you can hold down Alt, Middle Mouse, and then uh, find that point and snap it to that. So that's even weirder, but I'm very glad it's in there because it is great, but it is just like, takes a little bit to wrap your head around. Um, but I will continue using it actually. So in face select mode, in edit mode, um, you can see this is too high up. So I can just, uh, I mean, I could try and place it like this or I could hit B and then go this point to that point. Same here, G, B, this point to that point. Yeah, it's pretty pretty useful. I mean, it doesn't have to be this exact, I mean, this is just stuff that's outside of the frame, but, uh, but anyways, all right, and I'll move this out. So I do need to create a little bit of space here because the camera needs to sit here, obviously. Um, so there needs to be a bit of space there. But if I move inside, you should see some flickering. Yay for flickering. The flickering is because uh, obviously the cube comes with six faces, but we've already got two planes right here. And we don't really need those planes. We could actually map a marble texture to the cube, but then you have to deal with UV unwrapping and all that stuff. I find it's actually easier sometimes to just work with planes um, and use that instead. So instead with the cube here, uh, I'm just gonna remove the two faces that I don't need. So the back face and then this bottom face. So selecting those two and then hit X, which is another way to delete and not vertices. That's what we've been doing currently. Instead hit faces. So it's just deleting those faces. So now you should see you have, um, it's kind of like an open box, four sides and then the back and the bottom um, are open. And now what I need is an opening on the left-hand side to be that window. So to do that, I'm gonna cut into it so that I get a little bit of gap um, here on the left-hand side to be like the gap between the uh, the wall and the window. And then another gap here between um, yeah, the bottom of the countertop and you know. So I'm going to, yeah, inset. And for that tool, it's I. So I for inset. And it's now kind of like it's it's shrinking that face into itself. Um, and you're just like choosing its scale essentially. I'll hold down shift to get a more precise uh, movement and yeah, about there, that's pretty good. And now I just delete that face. So again, X and then faces. Awesome, so we should now see this, which in rendered view mode, whoops, rendered view mode, should hopefully look okay. Yeah, not bad. 
Um, now this window frame here, it really is just acting like, like the control for the light. So if I want, I can much more precisely place this. Like I don't want that much light coming in, um, you know, creating all that light on this side of the, the wall there. I can also say maybe I need more space here so that I've got a little bit of darkness so I could put some things uh, in the background without them falling into light. And then this bottom face here, sorry, this bottom edge, this is gonna control where the light starts in the scene, right? So if it's like all the way down here, then it's, uh, yeah, anyways, you get the idea. Just sort of shaping the light. Awesome, and now with the camera selected, I'll just move this down a little bit, angle it up. There we go. I mean, you can also just do this in um, uh, fly mode, shift tilde key, but I like hitting the uh, R tool and then just selecting the axes and I can just tilt the camera exactly where I want it. Awesome. So much better. We've, we've controlled the skylight. So the skylight is now longer coming in, but we have uncontrolled lighting in the sense that this wall here that's over here that is supposed to represent the rest of the kitchen is hitting and receiving all of that sunlight and it's just filling in all of this space uh, on the right hand side and that's not good because we want shadow shadow is actually a good thing it helps reveal form a lot of new artists like they get scared of shadow they're trying to like fill everything in and light everything you do want shadow shadow is a good thing so all this uncontrolled space is not good so essentially we need to do um just like what you would do in the real world and that's to create a uh like what a photographer would do they make like a, a black fill card right and that's just to essentially uh stop bounce lighting um, from hitting the subject so it's a good excuse to learn about a new feature. So with the cube selected, if I go to the materials and then hit new, uh, we're gonna keep the white material for everything else, right? White walls. But then I can add another material right underneath this one by hitting the plus button, then adding another material and I'll call this one black wall. And I actually will change the shader from principled to a much simpler uh, diffuse. It's just easier than, like easier for cycles to calculate than a full principled one. And then this, I'll just change the color to be really dark, almost black. All right, and now in edit mode, I'm gonna go face select, and I'm gonna select that one wall that I wanna have uh, the black wall material to. And then here I select it from the material list, black wall, and then hit assign. And importantly, you won't see the assign select these buttons, they'll only appear when you're in edit mode. So if you don't see it, it's because you're not in edit mode. So in edit mode, um, select the face, then you'll see it and hit assign. And now look at that, we have much more control. And in fact, because this light, uh, this uh, sunlight is hitting this, uh, this wall and it's currently dark, this color here now becomes almost like the control for how much fill light I want on the right hand side of the donuts. So the brighter it goes, the more fill light I get. Um, yeah, just a very simple way to control that lighting a bit better. Awesome, that's looking pretty good. The other thing I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna adjust the sun intensity. So there's a separate uh, measurement here just for intensity. Now you could like, you could drop the intensity of um, the whole sky texture as well. But when you do that, it also drops the sky texture. Right? Um, and so I found it was like, uh, for a while when the feature came out, I was like trying to, it was very hard to control. Um, but I realized like if you keep the strength at one, but then you reduce, reduce the sun intensity, um, you could like, for example, reduce the sun intensity like by a lot and then increase your uh, exposure. And then it's like the sunlight is there, but it's a lot softer, right? It's not like so overbearing. Um, but essentially what I want to do, I'm going to set this sun intensity to 0.5. So it's half of its brightness, but the sky texture has full brightness. So it's just a little, um, yeah, a little less hot, essentially. Awesome. Now, two things I will show you before we close this tutorial, um, which can be useful to know. One is how to import a model, okay? Because although as a beginner, it's good to understand modeling tools and know how to build things. Uh, when you start building scenes, it's very common, professional artists in studios, to just make use of model libraries because there is so much you need to model and cr basically fill in to create a realistic believable scene. It's just too much for one artist to do. So it's very common to make use of model libraries. 
So what I want you to do is click the link in the description and you will find this model, the wood utensils, which we're going to put in the background, is a free model and it's available in multiple softwares. The one we're looking for is the Blender file. So hit download on that. And then just like before, unzip the file that you receive and inside it, you should see a bunch of textures and then one dot blend file. Then we're going to go to file you would think import, but actually this is for um, external file extensions, like not blend files. If you want to import a blend file, it's actually the append option. Okay, so now we select that dot blend file, double click it, and now we're actually reading the blend file. We're reading the information inside that blend file, and it's saying, what do you want to import? Do you want to import just a single object from that blend file? Do you want to import uh, you know, a texture or a material perhaps? But in a lot of cases, if it's just a blend file that contains like one model, it's often gonna be in a collection, a single collection. So go into collection and then just click the one that's there and then hit append. And now, even though there is multiple objects as part of this, um, it's just brought in all of them and it's put it into a collection already, utensils jar 001. So now I'm just going to move this into the back of my scene and that's it. So that's how to import data from one blend file into another. It's going a little slow for me. I'm going to move that. There we go. So I just want it, yes, yeah, somewhere in the background like that. The other thing I want to show you how to do is how to install an add-on. Because although you might think that's kind of like an advanced user thing, you will very quickly realize that a lot of workflows rely on add-ons. So add-ons are very powerful and there's a lot of them out there and it's not actually clear how to install add-ons to beginners. So I thought I would include that. So obviously we're gonna use the uh, the Polygon add-on. I mentioned this uh, this earlier. It just lets you like download and import objects with, uh, with one click. And there's a bunch of free models in here as well. So you can actually get started with those and, and do some interesting things. Click the link in the description. This will take you to the download page and you're just looking to download that. Great, so you can see it's uh, downloaded a single zip file. And importantly, you do not want to unzip that zip file. And the reason is, is that Blender installs add-ons from the zip file that is unextracted. So to install an add-on, you go to edit, preferences, add-ons, and then at the top, click on install, then locate where you downloaded the zip file, just that there, and then you just hit install. And now if it's correct, if it's like found and located uh, an add-on inside that zip file, it should then automatically take you to the name of that add-on uh, in the search. So you just have it there. And then to enable it, you just do a single click to check it and it's now enabled. Now, obviously every add-on will have a different way of accessing it, but commonly they are in the sidebar, which is exactly where the Polygon one is. So you'll see the tab here. They might actually be changing the sidebar at some point in the future, but for now this is, uh, anyway, how it is. Um, so then just go log in via browser. It's gonna take you to the website. It'll say login confirmed, return back to the add-on uh, and you can type in free and you can see um, a whole bunch of different assets there. So actually one that I will uh, import if I go to my models section and then go to vegetation, there's a bunch of different plants here. Um, there's like four free ones, I believe. So you can use one of those. I'm gonna be using a paid one, just this uh, spider one I thought looked quite nice. But yeah, you can access uh, one of these, uh, these free ones if you want to. And there we go. Awesome. So this is our render. We are nearing the finish line. I can feel it. We're getting close. So join me in the next part. We're going to dive into the composition and then animation and then the final render. So click here and I'll see you there.